I did this a couple weeks with Ashley. I'm going to try it by myself because I just love this song. Your love knows no end. I mean, man, when we think about that, it's, I get uh, choked up thinking about that. It's been a cool week witnessing to some people who I just felt were so lost. 
got to share this with him just to say, man, his love knows me. No matter what you've done, he's there.
Love on your neighbor right here. You guys ready to worship this morning? All right. Would you agree with this statement that God is able? Amen. All right. That's the song. I wouldn't care. Wouldn't bother me in the least. Yeah, what do you think? Yeah? Can you give your credit card to somebody? Lindsay said he'll call it in. Oh, you got your guy that you got to get. I knew she was losing weight for somebody. <laughs> I thought it was because she was going back home to Kin Money for a while, but now I know. Hey. Okay. No, uh, let me encourage you guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I mean, it was kind of one of those things. We know the 4th of July is tomorrow, but it's been rained out. So uh, she knows you're serious. <laughs> but uh, appreciate you coming. If you're close to somebody, reach over and pat them on the back and say, I'm glad you're here tonight. You know, that type of deal. Yeah, there we go. No kisses there, Tom. Just pats on the back, okay? Yeah, but I... I'm glad that you guys are here tonight. I hate preaching to myself. It just doesn't sound near as good. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Hebrews. Just as a reminder to go back and remind you how we got back here to where we got back to. Uh, how in the world did we end up in Genesis when we're going through the book of Hebrews? Because in Hebrews 11, it talks a lot about different guys that were mentioned in the book of Genesis, including Abraham, including some that were faithful and all. And um, in doing so, my encouragement to you is that we can see a faithful life doesn't mean a perfect life. Uh, but in regard to faith, faith is a thing that has perseverance to it. It continues, and it's that continual transfer of our belief in ourselves over to our belief in God. And in doing so, the, the concept being that as we grow in him, we trust him more and more. Should be with a carte blanche to begin with, oftentimes is not. Um, that's the reason I use the Bible to preach from, and I do, and even as I admitted Monday night to the guys, recognize that myself, others, you can make the Bible say whatever you want. And I told them that one of the things that um, uh, can easily happen, whether it's individuals, especially with preachers, is you have this concept in your mind, and you go to the Bible to prove it. And some would say, well, what's wrong with that? Well, it's just the fact, because the Bible has so many different verses, you can almost make it twist and say whatever you want to say. But that the best approach, instead of coming with my mind made up and saying, I want to prove that the Bible says what I think, the better thing to do is say, man, God, I don't know. My mind is yours. Show me what to think. And it doesn't mean that we're clueless. It doesn't mean that I don't want smart or thinking people. It's not that at all. I want you to be thinkers. But what I want you to recognize is as we talked Friday night with the uh, 
get your house in order seminar there just to providing a free service to people to understand that legalities there are legalities that come about with whether it's our near-death experience with hospitalization if you're out of it how if you don't have a directive a living directive that uh, you know it's difficult to get attention the doctors have to decide on their own and you your spouse or somebody else could have to go to court on your behalf depending on how it's lined up but if you've declared here's what i want to happen to me it makes it easy when we die the reason that we encourage people to have wills is because otherwise the state has one for you and it's just the comprehension of that and all the things that can go with it but with a simple piece of paper by declaring it and one of the interesting things that this guy brought out was the fact that uh, you know within your will you want to make sure that you have somebody that you trust to carry out your directives and uh, the executor of your will would be somebody that will take what your wishes are and see to it that that's what's applied and understood and he said it's important to get somebody that's pretty sound in mind in other words it's not going to easily be persuaded or try to please everybody because it needs to be the way it was done and in doing so i thought wow how cool because isn't that exactly what i'm supposed to do with the bible is to share with you and we each read on our own as well but to see what god's will is and it might not be popular it might not be politically correct at all times it may not be this or that but it's what god said and the smartest thing that we can do is go I may not understand it, but God said it, I believe it. You know, that settles it. And that's the best way to live. Well, that kind of faith takes a while for some people to be able to get to. And so in understanding faith, I think it's vital that uh, we look at people, and as we have with Jacob, as we did with Abraham, we did with Isaac, we see that the lives will go through many different stages, and it's important to be faithful through them all. But uh, just for the kicks and grins of it, let's begin reading here in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. Kicks and grins, you haven't had this for a while. All right, maybe we better pray first, okay? Father and God, I do thank you for these that are here. And when many would say, hey, it's a holiday, God, uh, I pray your blessing on those that are here that it's a holy day. And a day, Lord, with you, a day where your holiness becomes ours. And Jesus, thank you that uh, because of your great love for us, because of your dying for us and then resurrecting with God's amen, that um, technically in heaven your holiness is ours your righteousness has become ours in spite of the fact like paul wrote that we're filthy rags that uh, lord you've taken over but at the same time what's cool is you've given us your spirit that we can become lord those that are becoming holy and i thank you for that and god it's easy to dodge and just to let it be all on your shoulders jesus but man isn't it a great respect and love to turn around and say wow because of what you've done for me here's what i want to do for you and Lord, tonight I pray to do for these that are yours, that I would be able to share your word, that uh, God, it's the what is powerful and effective, and it's your Holy Spirit that can take this word home. And, I, and by home, I mean to the heart and to the mind that we can apply it to our lives. Thankful, God, that you've shown me with your wisdom that uh, everybody grows at a different rate and that there's no way to cookie cutter this thing out. But God, it's through each individual and personality. But Lord, may we help each other along the way, whether it's the way we live, the way we understand and growing through, or asking for help even, Lord. And tonight, I just pray that, God, that the one thing that we wouldn't miss is something that you're trying to say to us tonight. And yet, for the 50 of us that may be here, God, that could be 50 different messages. And I thank you for that. There's great freedom in that. And Lord, I just pray that as a church that we would become that, that although we're one, uh, Lord, each person is still an individual. And God, that we want to be one in what we, your word says, but there's different ways that you'll live that out in our lives. And may we, Lord, just seek to do it for you and to your glory. Tonight, God, I pray that you would be glorified by my speaking, but Lord, I also come to you like a kid on Father's Day and saying, will you give me, Lord, the gift to be able to glorify you, the gift to be able to speak tonight and to share, Lord, in a way that would make sense to grant insight, Lord, that would be from you and your message from your heart, your throne to this earth and our hearts. And God, that in that way that you would also speak to me. And I just ask that God, that you would help us in this walk to never miss your love and to not misunderstand it, but to know that you love us enough too, that you want us to grow up. And uh, just as any father, Lord, or mo mother would want to see in their children. And so thank you for that great love. Thank you for the fun that we can have, even in the midst of, Lord, the serious things that go on with life and death. And I just pray tonight, Lord, that you would not only bless us, but those downstairs, as well as, Lord, um, our junior hires and DJ and Diana and Lindsay is their Lord, away on, on the MOVE uh, conference with CIY. Thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So just as a reminder, let's go back here and read Hebrews 11. Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for, certain of what we don't see. 
Might not understand it, might not be able to, compl- or to explain it, might not be tangible at all, but faith is certainty and surety, okay? Even though we don't see. That is what the ancients were commended for, and we've been looking at the ancients. By faith, we understand the universe was formed at God's command, so what's seen was not made out of what was visible. It was made out of nothing. That's what you can do if you're God. By faith, Abel offered a God a better sacrifice than Cain did, and by faith, he was commended as a righteous man who, when God spoke well of his offerings. By faith, he still speaks, even though he's dead. Man, that's amazing, isn't it? By faith, he still speaks, even though he's dead. And by faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he didn't experience death. He couldn't be found because God had taken him away. But before, before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And then we get that famous, or at least I use it a lot to remind myself of what faith is. Verse 6, and without, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So what was it Enoch was commended for? Man, because he was faithful to God. And so without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone that comes to him must believe he exists. And then I love this. God just dangles it in front of us, not as a, a taunting kind of a trap or anything that way, but says, man, you know, I just would love to reward you. And uh, so faith is believing that God not only exists, but he rewards those that what? Earnestly seek him. And not once, but continually seek him in earnest. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen in holy fill, fear, excuse me, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, then, he condemned the world and became the heir of righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he'd later receive as, it is, as his inheritance, he obeyed and he went, even though he didn't know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in a promised land. Whose promise? God's. In a land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. Why did he do that? For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, not the tent, but the city with great foundations, and uh, whose architect and builder is God. I love that. By faith, Abraham, even though he was past age and Sarah herself was barren, he was able or enabled to become a father because he considered him faithful, which is God, who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and I love this, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. Because why? Because God had this great imagination and spoke it, and Abraham was dumb enough to believe it and say, that doesn't logically make sense. There's no way a man my age, but God, if you said it, I'm going to go with it. So all these people then, when it's all said and done, were still living by faith when they died. That's the crutch of it all, okay, or the crux of it all that they were still living by faith when they died. It wasn't just that they had faith at one time or they got a cup full of it. It didn't mean they just stopped with a bushel basket. They continued to build faith throughout their life and they were still living by their faith. And I share that and I emphasize that with you because that's what's vital to us. It's, you know, starters, as Chuck Swindoll said one time, starters are a dime a dozen. But finding people that will go to the end of the uh, the race, to the finish line, that's a little bit different. Tomorrow, at this point in time, at least the last I heard, they hadn't canceled the Peachtree Road Race. Don't look for me. I won't be running in it. I won't be watching or cheering anybody on. But I, in my heart, there's a couple of people I know that are, and more power to them. You know, man, if you can do it, that's great. Uh, run a mile for me, too. But, you know, they're going to be doing that, and there will be all kinds of people start. But I promise you, not everybody will find it to the end. Not making fun of them or anything else. It's just because that's our nature. When it gets tough, sometimes we give up. And yet the faithful go ahead and we don't give up as we're faithful because giving up isn't us giving up in our ability. Giving up is us giving up on God's ability. And that's what it's saying that these folks, including Abraham in this situation, even though he waited from the time that God promised, made the promise to him, he waited 25 years before he saw that promise fulfilled. 25 years. Just got older and older and older as it went along. And I mean, but he held to the fact God said it. I still believe he can do it. So he was called when he was how old? 75. So when he's 100, he finally has this kid. Amazing, isn't it? And he considered that to be a great thing, not me. You know, but that was the way it was. And so they're still living by faith when they died. They continued to grow in their belief that God was faithful to them. How can we be anything but faithful back to him? So all these people were still living by faith when they died. They didn't receive the things promised, the ultimate, which was Jesus. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted, or they lived with this mindset, that uh, they were aliens and strangers on the earth, that their heart was in heaven, not here. People who say such things show they're looking for a country of their own. If they'd been thinking of the country they'd left, why, they could have had opportunity to return. 
And it's just like us with our lifestyles or various other things. You can always go back if you want. Why would you? And Peter is the one that talks about that. Some of you have reminded me that, man, that's just flat gross when it talks about like a sow that is washed that goes back to the mud and a dog that throws up and goes and eats his vomit. That's what it's like when we accept Christ and we turn. That's not my words. That's out of the Bible, folks. But, you know, it's gross as can be. But what a picture when we walk with God and we turn around and go back walking with the world or with whatever else it would be. So these people kept looking forward to the architect who was God. Um, verse 15, if they'd been thinking of the country they'd left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. And I love this. This is so cool because this can be you and it can be me. It can be all of us. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. A lot of people are going to claim, that's my God. And he's going to look at them and go, ah, get away from me, I never knew you. But those of us that live for him, he's not ashamed to call us his or to have us call him our God. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And that's why oftentimes we'll mention in our day and age, there are a lot of designer gods. There are a lot of people that never read the Bible or have only read certain things out of the Bible, and they pick and they choose Christianity cafeteria style, I call it, where it's, I'll have some of this, but nah, I don't want any vegetables, you know? I like a lot of dessert, you know, but leave this alone. And they believe that they can create their own God that fits them, and I've had a lot of people tell me, well, my God's just not like that. Well, you better make sure if you want the heaven of the Bible, <laughs> you pick the God of the Bible, because otherwise your God may not be able to deliver you from hell. You know, I mean, that's just the way it works, folks. You can't serve a different God but expect to go to heaven. It doesn't work that way. And what it shows instead that he, he absolutely loves it when we call him our God and we live in a way that we show he really is number one to us. We believe that he can do whatever he has said and we'll do whatever he asks us to do. So it goes on then from there, verse 17, by faith Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. So this guy that waited 25 years to get his son gets him, and God said, hey, sacrifice him to me. He who had received the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, and even though God had said to him, it's through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Well, Abraham, though, in the midst of this, reasoned when God called him and he went to do it, then to follow through, he reasoned God could raise the dead. It's like, okay, if God's asked me to do it, but God made these other promises, and there's no way they can be fulfilled without Isaac, so... I'll go ahead and take his life, God, to show you I believe in you. And it said, so figuratively speaking, he thought, well, God can raise the dead. And figuratively, excuse me, figuratively speaking, he did because he was already dead in Abraham's mind. He was going to go through with it. But we know the rest of the story that God said, that's enough. Now I know. And then the part that got us back there was Abraham. We went back to look at Noah. But now uh, what we read here is Isaac, by faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. I couldn't tell you how many weeks we've been looking at Isaac and Jacob and uh, or excuse me Jacob and Esau in regard to Isaac and uh, that in this regard to it then that what has happened is by faith Jacob when he was dying he blessed each of Joseph's sons we're about to that and he worshiped his and leaned on top of his staff now so what we've been doing is back here in, in Genesis and as we're going to go back tonight pick up where we left off uh, somewhere around chapter 35 and so as we go back there I just wanted to establish that all of this and these lives that we've been looking at are pictures that we can trust because from this view of, of so to speak, that we're looking at the past. And so from a historical perspective, the book of Hebrews was written about these people who were faithful. And so we've been looking at Jacob, seeing in his life how he operated underneath this faith and how his faith in God produced in a faithful life that not only believed in God but would go ahead and follow him, would still listen for him. And as I've mentioned several times, I want to remind you again what's totally amazing to me about this and where I admire Jacob, even though there's things about Jacob that's like, why did you do it that way? Even though he began as a deceiver and ends up being called the one who wrestled God as Israel, that there's things about this that I really admire because Jacob did not have a Bible. He didn't have one chapter. He didn't have the book of Genesis. He didn't have anything. All he had was his story or whatever he'd heard in his own heart and this, this incessant magnetic thing inside of us that tries to find our creator. And that's what creates religions and various things and superstitions and all like that. That's where, you know, we see on movies different things they believe in, throwing people to the fire and everything else to please the gods. Well, Jacob had something in him and he also had received i believe the stories from abraham and abraham and the god that he walked with and it was different than some of the other gods and it was believed that there was just god and you didn't have all these others but it was just one god that was over all the gods 
but he didn't have a Bible, not one chapter. He didn't have any promise of the Holy Spirit. And I'm not going to tell you the Holy Spirit wasn't operating upon or around or with, but I can guarantee you this, that because there wasn't salvation, there wasn't any inward promise of the Holy Spirit that you and I have been given, that Jesus brought to us so that his Spirit would not just be upon us, but within us. And so he didn't have that. He didn't have the cross to look at and to say, man, that's how much God loves us. He didn't have anything to go off of other than inside he heard this voice and he believed and he chose to follow it and it was a voice that did speak and i'm not telling you that god never spoke out loud i'm just going to tell you he didn't always speak out loud and today to this day one of the greatest things that you and i can do is to sharpen our hearing and increase our prayers and say lord just please don't let me miss hearing you when you speak but god doesn't just speak in one dimension God, you know, if you're waiting for the lightning bolt and the thunder out of the clouds, I would warn you that usually when that happened, it wasn't good. Ask Paul, who spent three days in blindness, you know, because of the bright light that when God did speak and others thought it was just thundering or they heard something but didn't know what it was, you know, so God can do that. But I've not had it happen to me. And I'm kind of glad because it's like, I feel like, man, when he gets to that extent, it's really dangerous territory that he might be rescuing you from. But God does speak, or he can speak that way if he wants to. He does speak, we know, from his word. As I've told you, and for us that are Christians, and this is his generalized word, it's the same for every one of us in this room. This is what God's will is for every Christian, everybody that would say, God is the one that I have given my life to, okay? This word applies. And it's not going to be minced out according to what you think. It's going to be according to what God thinks. It's why we each ought to read it, is to grow to understand what God has already told us. But then beyond that, he goes from the generalization, and that's what this is, a generic will of God for every human being. But then we know what? He goes through the personalization, which is what? The Holy Spirit. And it's there that God's Spirit speaks to us through everything from feelings to that still small voice that we hear inside to sometimes, and and it's much the same way as what the devil would speak to us, you know, with temptation or whatever. Those questions that might come up, although I find most of the time God will go, "Um, no, that's not it. And why don't you do, or you ought to do, or whatever it would be. But the Holy Spirit will personalize this generalized will of God. God's word tells us that we ought to be people that serve. God's spirit will lead us where we're to serve. God's word tells us we ought to be people that give financially. We give, we share. The Holy Spirit will guide us toward, if we ask and allow him, he will lead us toward where we can share, when we can share, what we should share, that type of thing. And the whole process of it, folks, ought to be continually improving as we go through life. I'm not going to stand here and tell you it just gets easier and easier. I'm not going to say that at all. But I will tell you this, that undeniably, deep down in, I nearly always know when God speaks. I can pretend I might not have heard that or, you know, oh, I think I have something else, you know, and try to shift this thing around. But down inside, you know. And it's no different than when you come close to that life and death situation, you know what your sins already are. Nobody has to go over them with you and say, now, do you have a few sins you need to repent from? All of a sudden you're going, oh my God, I'm going to cry. And I, you know, please don't hold that. I need to, I'm, I'm sorry, forgive me, you know. And y- you know what they are, don't you? You can pretend all the time you don't, but deep down inside when it comes to, I hope at communion time that some of you are confronted and go, I know you know, and I need to tell you I know, and I shouldn't, and I... God, with your help, please don't just forgive me, but let me overcome, right? So the Holy Spirit personalizes this generalized will of God. And the whole thing is, as we know from Scripture, that God doesn't miss a thing that's going on. He knows even if we lose one strand of hair, whether it's an eyelash or out of our head or whatever it may be, God knows or the hair off your back, man, and you praise God on that coming off. But he knows every hair that falls. I mean, he watches us that closely. So he's not unaware of what's going on in our life. And all that faith does, it calls us to go ahead and to live in that way. And instead of hoping not, it's rather instead coming into the light and being open before God. And it's allowing him and and wanting to have fellowship. But sometimes when people act as though that they've got the magic antennas out and that they hear from God better than anybody else, there are some that do seem to, but I think they're just more attentive. But I think what's going to be sad is when we get to heaven, we found out how many times God spoke and we didn't hear. But it's not like God tells me every morning when I get up, here's what I want you to do today, Steve. So if you're expecting God to lay out your agenda, you know, and tell you what clothes to wear and everything else, I mean, I think it's good to ask him. But if he doesn't tell you, then be a big boy, be a big girl, pull up your pants and get going, you know. But somewhere along the line, God also wants us to do things for him like my dad did was, hey, I don't want to have to tell you every single thing to do. Just some of the things you know, go and do. 
So as we go through these lives, I want you to see how that works. And I want you to see that God didn't speak to every situation or tell them everything, but when he did speak, it was vital that they listened and that they responded. What we read here in chapter 35 and gone over the last couple of weeks is that God told him after his sons had done a terrible thing, he told him to go and go back to Bethel. He said, go back there to where, you know, you knew I was, and I want you to build an altar. And we saw that, and we talked about that, that he did. But in going back, why? God knew that what Jacob needed to do was to get his compass realigned and find out what was due north. God knew that Jacob was rattled right now, and he's all concerned and worried about what those boys did that's going to come back on him, and it could have. But God's wanting to restore him and say, hey, I'll protect you. And that's what's so cool as we read that then the fear or the terror of God fell upon these other people and they weren't about to try to conquer or to take advantage of Jacob and his whole clan of people here. Pretty amazing type thing. But God also knew that Jacob needed this time with God and God wanted to reiterate to him the promise that he'd given him. And I think there are different times that God's going to remind us of that. The promise of salvation, yes. But I don't feel like as a, ser uh, a, a servant of God or of you that I have to preach the message of salvation every time. But I always want people to know that the salvation is there and it's waiting. But for those of us that have received it, what I do believe is we need to do something with the new life we've been given. And we need to respond to God in that. And what this shows then, as we looked last week and we're going to look tonight, is that also the other thing that happens is death comes about. And that that's one of the biggest times that we really need to know that we're on track with God. And a part of living is dying. It's like that doctor that told Julie, you know, or she didn't like, he told me the same thing. But after the good news about how my blood was doing and what the liver was going on and everything that way and things that he couldn't explain, I said, well, that's good, isn't it? He goes, it's not bad news. And, uh, but Julie looks at him and goes, but what? And he goes, but you still have a life-threatening disease. That's sobering, isn't it? I thought, what human being that's taking breath right now doesn't have a life-threatening disease? If your heart quits beating, guess what? You quit living. Death is yours. You know, it's just that simple. And so we need to have this awareness of it because there's something about, you know, you can live pretending or the proverbial ostrich with your head in the sand, and that's not going to do you any good. It's like looking at it. I mean, it's a regular part of my conversation with God is, man, Lord, you gave me another day. Is that good or is that bad? Am I not completing my mission? Is that why I'm still here? But I kind of look at it from a standpoint of when I go to bed, it's like, wow, man, which place will I wake up in the morning? Wake up dead, but in heaven or wake up alive and still here? Is it because I did my job or didn't do my job? Which is it, you know? Because I tend to believe that there's a mission that God's got for every one of us. And when you fulfill it, you get to check out. Now, some of you will put off doing any mission at all then if that's the way it is. I'm just not that sold on this place like all of you. But man, I love God. And I believe what he's got in store is far better than anything we could imagine. But uh, what you see here then is through these people and through their life events, you see how you can go through life and you can either worry yourself to death and you can try to take it all upon yourself or you can remind yourself, what were the promises of God? Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. That I love you like you would never believe. You know, this type of thing, the love of Christ that he poured out for us. I mean, we forget those things and we let such small potato things in our lives overwhelm us and we miss God. And instead, what we ought to be overwhelmed with is how large our God is to the point we look at those things and say, God, you got those handled, man. If you've taken care of me, you'll take care of those things because he's given us promises. Now, I don't claim every promise God gave to Jacob. Some people do, and I just don't because I think there's some things that are personal. And I think the same way with Abraham, promised he'd have a son. God never told me that. God told me, though, through Jesus Christ, he promised those that would follow him that if you leave your mother and your father and your family and your farms, I will give you 10, 20, 30, even 100-fold. I believe you are a part of that 100-fold family of mine. I am, I am so humbled that I have people that aren't my blood relatives other than the blood of Jesus, but are closer to me than my blood relatives are some of them. And I'm humbled by that. I mean, I'm overwhelmed by that. God fulfills his promises. I, I may not farm for a living or have that in that regard, but thankfully, I mean, it's a part of dad's will and what he's given to us in that sense that passed on from generation to generation and everything. But, but man, it's like here, there still is a field that I get to work and you're a part of that and you work alongside me. I just find that phenomenal. So you see, there are promises of God that we've got to be aware of because as you read them, then as you see them fulfilled, you need to thank him for that. 
not concentrating on all these that he gave specifically to certain people. But look at some of those general ones and watch and see how God will fulfill in your life. So where we're at tonight then is we're caught up here, chapter 35, verse 16. And uh, after building this altar and uh, putting up and going back in the stone pillar and either whether he really went back and did that all over again or whether it was just the fact that he was reminded of it, we, we move on. It said they moved on from Bethel. Well, in chapter 35, at the beginning of it, God said, go to Bethel and settle there. But see, what we don't know is it doesn't say on day six or two years later, six years later. It just said then they moved on from Bethel. There was a period of time, and I trust that Jacob, a part of faithfulness, was you go where God tells you, and you stay there till God moves you again, unless there's something that, you know, you feel from God that's saying, now you can do whatever you want. God knew he needed this respite. He'd taken it. He'd taken a time of catching up, putting things in order, and it says they moved on from there. The other part of it was he had what? Flocks and herds. You can't just stay at one place if you've got flocks and herds unless you've got thousands of acres. Because even then you've got to move them around because with the heat and the drought and different things like that, the grass would dry up. Um, I don't know if you all know it or not, but one of the things that's really dangerous with sheep is that they don't know when to quit eating the, the grass. Like some didn't know when to quit smoking it, but they don't know when to quit eating it. I mean, they will take it clear down to the root and kill it because it's just like everything, you know, they ate it the one day and they come back and, and like me, I mean, I don't... I, I love when I can go two weeks without mowing my yard. Man, not the sheep. They come back the next day and say, new green. They go, rrr, 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 and they chew it right down. And they can literally kill it, especially if there's no rain. And so smart shepherds move their sheep because they want to come back and feed the grass here again sometime. Simple thing, logical, very practical. I don't know what's involved here. The Bible doesn't tell us that. I'm just sharing with you some possibilities. I mean, it may have been a year, two years later. It may have been two months later when the sheep had eaten everything up, you know, but they moved on from Bethel. It's okay sometimes. There's times that God calls us to to hold and to rest. As a church, one of the things that we've prayed, and it's always been in my heart, was to be a church that's like in the Old Testament, the city of refuge. I don't know if you know what a city of refuge was. It was cities that were designated that when somebody like the George Zimmerman thing, somebody in self-defense might have killed somebody and other people get mad. It's a place you can run to and be protected. You know, that they will give you asylum and give you a chance. Now, they'll find out what the facts are, share those facts and, and in other words, but it's a place, a safe place to be. And I've always looked at that because I'll tell you what, I found a lot of people that have been beat up and sometimes very severely by other churches. And I think that it's vital. And that's one of the reasons why the day you come in, we don't meet you with a membership card and follow you up and even bring you a bunch of cookies to get all your information, your W-2s and everything like that to find out, you know, how we can start getting money from you, you know. We don't do that. In fact, we tell you if you want, you have to ask for it because we're just not going to surround you. We want to give you the opportunity wherever you're at. One, we may not be the church for you. Two, it takes a while to be bold enough to say, uh, even as I see Karen and her family, that This is where God's called us. This is where we're supposed to serve. I hope last week some of you saw when Kenny and Donna, when they shared, man, we've been here, but now we're moving almost to Alabama. God bless them. And Mary Jo, uh, you know, but they're moving almost to Alabama or they're to Buckhannon or whatever that way. And uh, said, it's not going to be practical. It's not that we'll never be back, but you are our family of God. You've been here. Here's what we've gained from it. Might you continue on, but we're going to take what you've given us and we're going to share it with others. And one of the things that Kenny and Don are hoping to do is to start one of those house churches, even with the, to begin with, with the live feeds. If they don't find a congregation that they can plug into, that's what they're going to do is to start one. I think it's that cool. You know, that's just, but that's the way that can work. But when you give people their time to heal, then they get back in. But one of the things that also happens sometimes is people get used to doing nothing. And so they come and they sit and that's great. But somewhere along the line, it's like, let God heal you, strengthen you, get busy, you know, be a part of the body. And that's where I think it's vital, again, that we listen to the Holy Spirit. That when he starts prompting us to be involved, when he starts prompting us to help out here or to do that or to teach or to, you know, to say, I don't know that I can do that, but with God's help, I'll try. And that's one of the things that we try to do here, too, is that we try to not just lock you into it forever, And as I was preaching last Sunday, I want to continue this week, but to show you how the giftedness of God may begin in one place. But when we're faithful to him and respond in something, God, I can't do without you, but if you want me to do this, then I presume you'll supply. We're faithful with that. Then don't be surprised when he leads you to something else. 
That's why one of the things that I always want to encourage you, whatever job you've got, is that you train somebody to take your place. Why? Because one, you never know when you're going to die. Very practical reason right there. Number two, you never know when God's going to say, okay, I've got something else for you to do. And if you've trained this other person, inspired and shown them how you did and why you did, they're ready, you know, and it just helps things to continue on. And you say, you got all that from there? Yeah, I did. You know, I mean, they moved on. Time to move on, okay? Then they moved on from Bethel. I'm going to move on in this message. While they were still some distance from Ephrath, and some of you may be going, man, have I heard that? Mm hmm. Uh, because one of the uh, things you hear at Christmas time is one of the prophecies that there was, and we'll look at. But Ephrath was uh, right there. It was a region around Bethlehem. Who was born in Bethlehem? Good job, man. I'm so proud of you. Yeah. He had about a hundred, hundred chance of doing that. Uh, yeah, that's where it was. It was kind of like, I think, like what Bethel was the godly name for it or whatever. Bethlehem became, but you know, man, this, it was Ephrath when it began. When the Canaanites were there, it was that. About six miles, thereabouts, four to six miles outside of Jerusalem, okay, depending on how big the city of Jerusalem was at the time. But I remember going and being there in that area and shocked that I thought Bethlehem was way off in the distance, and it wasn't. It was just a few miles. Now, if you had to walk it, it'd probably seem like a long time. But it says they moved on to, from Bethel. While they were still some distance from the area of Bethlehem or Ephrath, Rachel began to give birth and had great difficulty. So she'd gotten pregnant. And she's the one that, man, had only had one and wanted to have another and never had and blah, 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 you know. And so she gets pregnant uh, and she gives birth. She has great difficulty. And she was having great difficulty in childbirth. The midwife said to her, don't be afraid for you have another son. So she's trying to encourage her and say, oh man, you, I know it's taken everything you've got, but don't worry, man, you've got another boy. Does anybody remember what her first boy was? I ain't gonna look it up, but I think it was Joseph, correct? Joseph, I believe it was, was her first and only son till this one is born. And so she said, you got another son. And as she breathed her last, for she was dying, and that's maybe where we got that phrase, right? She named her son Ben-Onai, but his father named him Benjamin. And when you read down the footnotes, uh, it basically talks about the difference between the two of those and that uh, Ben-Onai is son of my trouble. Benjamin means son of my right hand. And so she knew that something wasn't going good inside. She had a midwife, but she didn't have a doctor or anything like that. We aren't told what happened, but... It was a life-threatening birth, and her life expired. And so she was saying, son of trouble, but um, dad, her husband, went ahead and picked up on it and said, oh, no, man, I'm going to make him special. He's son of my right hand. The last son born to him, and he's saying, this child means the world to me because he came from his favorite wife, which is never a good idea, but it came from his favorite wife. So here we have... The, what? Did I just say something bad or wrong or what? Just a, never a good idea to have a favorite wife. But yeah, yeah. If you got more than one, that means you got to have a favorite, you know. But it's like Julie was my last wife. Um, you know, uh, anyway, so here she dies. Here Jacob is faithful. And I find it just so extremely impressive. Jacob's not out there. God, why'd you let this happen to me? How's that work? Because if your faith is in God and with God, you build the relationship with him and you know that there are things in this world that will happen and you're not stunned and startled that it's not what you planned, but you trust that it's part of the plan of God. And I know that that can come very strongly across and I always try to be careful that it's one thing for me to say as with the liver disease and one thing like that that I had, that, well, God's will, you know, it's another thing for you to tell me you've got something. Well, God's will, you know, I don't mean to ever do that. But for me, I'm satisfied at that because I really do believe it's God's. And if it's not, he can turn it around. If he doesn't, he's still God. He's still great. He's still the best. He still loves me. He still loves you. His plans are beyond mine. His ways are beyond my understanding. One of my favorite parts of the book of Job is I don't like all that suffering in the beginning. I love Job going, blessed be the name of the Lord. But at the end of Job, I mean, all the way through the middle, the reason I hate reading that is the last thing I want to be is one of Job's friends that were, oh, you've done something wrong, you know, and they didn't listen to anything. But at the end, I love it because that's when God shows up and God goes, okay, Mr. Smarty Pants, all of you guys, tell me how much you know. Where were you when the mountain goat gives birth? 
Where are those storehouses of snow and of ice that I keep preserved at certain times I send? I'm like, man, those are some pretty cool questions. That's why I said I can't wait to get to heaven because I think God's going to answer some of that stuff and show, here's how I did that. You know, I could paralyze a city with a few little water molecules with just the right temperature anyway. You know, I mean, it's amazing, but, but that's what I think is so cool is when we put God in the right place, he's high and lifted up. And when he's high and lifted up, our admiration is unto him and about him. And it understands and says, okay, I'm willing to do whatever you want because you've got a better view of what's happening all the way around. You know how you created me. You know what I can handle. You've promised not to put one of the things we've got a benefit of is uh, passages that say, I won't put on you more than you can bear. I will work all things to good if you're loving me and called according to my purpose. That's a good reason to love God and be a part of his purpose and know what his purpose for you is so that you just stay confident. And that's what I see with Jacob. His faith was deeper now than it was at the beginning because God had done everything he said he would do. Now, God didn't tell him ahead of time, your wife's going to have a baby, but she's going to die. What do you want, a live mom or, or a live wife or a, a new baby? He didn't give him that option. This happened. So what do you do? You do what he did. You recognize it. And you understand and you mourn and you grieve, but you release like Job said, when I came in, I didn't have anything. When I leave, I won't have anything. And if I lose things while I'm here, why am I surprised? Blessed be the name of the Lord. And so Rachel died. She was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. Over her tomb, Jacob set up a pillar. And to this day, that pillar marks Rachel's tomb. Israel moved on again. He pitched his tent beyond Midgal Eber. Man, I mean, don't you hate that? It's like, oh, what's the rest of the story? I don't know. We got to hear it someday. That's why I said, be careful. I mean, although I believe this is chronological, we, don't to, we aren't told what the whole chronology is. But there comes a point in time where we pick up and we move on. And there comes another point where we pick up and we move on. And that's what it says. He moved on again. Why? Because no big deal. She was just my favorite wife. No. It was a huge deal to him. It was overwhelming. But God was still God. He was still alive. There's still things to do. Not because... I got to get busy. I got to go burn. No, it was just the fact that that is a part of life. We are amazing. Even though we call ourselves Christians, are part of a Christian nation, we're so amazing that we act so stunned at death when we ought to know that it's a certain type of a deal. It's going to happen, right? But we live pretending, not to me, it won't. And yet there are times it does. And we think, well, it won't happen until... And we talk about all these things of, you know, when we retire, we're going to do this and... You know, I'm going to save this up for that. And I got to ask you, did God tell you to save up for retirement? Maybe you're wasting your money. <laughs> Maybe you ought to be enjoying, you know, living now. Uh, I know far too many, and I don't mean to make fun of it or whatever. I just know a lot of people that within five years of retiring, they died. And I kind of get the feeling, don't retire. <laughs> you know, I look at my account, my savings account, and I say, don't have to worry. I can't. You know, I mean, it's pretty easy. I'll just keep working, you know, praise the Lord. I hope I don't lose my voice. And, uh, you know, but, but there are things that take place. I, uh, yesterday was Tuesday's my day off, and I was watching on Fox, and I had Fox News on. And, man, it was one of the things that caught my eye. They said it was coming up, and so I waited. And is this kid that back after 9-11, that uh, when the call came and the military and a lot of people signed up, this kid went ahead and strapping young guy and, I think he was 18 years old. He signed up and got in the military. I don't remember what, which area of service, Army or Marines or whatever he was in. I don't remember that. I just, I want to say he was a Marine. But anyway, he signed up and, and uh, on patrol and things are going good. And I don't remember how many tours or whatever. But suddenly there was one of those uh, IEDs that went off. And uh, I always have to be careful not to say an IUD, but IED that went off. Sorry, some of you got it. Uh, <laughs> anyway. Just so you know, I'm human, right? But this thing goes off, and um, he and a buddy of his uh, were close by, and he lost both arms and both legs. And not just like a foot, but I mean, we're talking up to here type of deal. And, uh, but he lived. And it was such a cool story to watch. And uh, they asked him, they said, well, what was your first reaction? He goes, that can't be me. And uh, how can I do anything? And he said, then I realized I can't do anything. If I'm thinking I can't do anything, I've got to start doing something. So I'm going to do what I can. I'm alive for a reason. And how he's got prosthesis on both arms and both legs. And, 
And it was kind of cool how they put a short set on that were, you know, would only gone down to about normal knees that he learned to walk with first and that he went from there to then the full length ones. And, but it's been, I mean, two years, folks, and he's still learning and growing. Two years later. And his wife stayed with him. And their little girl now is two years old. And uh, it's just, but the attitude. And, you know, they ask him, and I mean, it very, very strongly implied uh, they didn't go, we go to such and such church or anything like that, but their faith in God. And that's what faith in God can do is say, you know, if God had wanted my life to be over, it could have been. And it seems like it. And I've oftentimes said, you know, theoretically, you can take my arms off and my legs off and I'm still here because my soul isn't in my body. I mean, it's housed there, but it's not directly proportionate to life and limb, right? It's directly proportional to this mind and not my heart. And, uh, you know, if you're still alive, that there's still something you can do for God. How many of you have watched that guy that can't even think of his name, but he was born that way, and he just got a, like a little flipper or something like that, and one of the most inspirational, Nick, yeah, one of the most inspirational people you can ever listen to, YouTube, but just look it up, man. But, man, I mean, he's got a pool in his backyard. He dives in and swims, and it's like... How do you ever get out of that thing, you know? I mean, with nothing there to pull yourself up with. But man, I'll tell you what, he's got more courage than anybody I know. And it's that kind of stuff that's just phenomenal. How does it happen? It happens because you either look and stare and stare and stare and get fixated upon how bad things are, or instead you look to God and you look and you say, like I do, man, I deserve hell and anything less than that's your grace. And God... I've got a great life. How do you want me to live it for you? How do you want to take my life and use it to your glory? Abraham moved on. There have been a lot of things. I hated leaving Bloomington, Indiana. I loved that church. But I'd never known you guys if I'd have stayed. And now I love you. I think Scott just told the joke about what you call a guy in the water. <laughs> um, I loved that church. And when God blew the whistle and said, time's up, and it was time to move on. Man, in my heart, it was like, huh. But it was one of those things that in my heart, I knew what he'd called. And as I said, I'd never met any of you, and some of you, I probably wish I hadn't, but you know I mean? I'd never met any of you if I'd have stayed where I was comfortable or where I was at home. And it's one of the things that even now at this stage, you know, after being down here for 14 years, that there's just a part of me that I, I try to regularly spend time with God every six months just to say, okay, God, is this still where? Because I don't want to ignore his calling if he's called someplace else. Not because I'm wanting to get out of here. It's just because I don't want to be stuck here, dum de dum de dum de dum because I'm not paying any attention to God and I'm just enjoying you. So for me, ministry is about God first, even though I love you and I hope that this is where I die. Honestly, I don't want to move anyplace else. And uh, Julie doesn't want to have to move us either, you know, but, but even in the midst of all that, my bigger thing is with God. And as things happen and unfold, I mean, I've played out in my mind and I can't go very far with it because I've got such a small mind. But what happens when I lose my mom or my dad, like some of you have done? And all I can do is say, God, I trust you've prepared me for that. Um, I don't know how much time it will take. A lot depends, on, I guess you could say, how it happens. I, I don't know. Where do I need to be when, if, if it's something that's a long-term illness? Julie's wrestling with that right now with her mom and some of the things going on. And that's tough. But our ultimate allegiance is to God. And it's faith that says, all right, we'll continue to do what you've called us to do. Trust that you'll give us guidance about other things. But there's times we move on. And by moving on, again, I mean talking about you get your life back on track, you move on to do whatever God's called you to do, and you keep on living. Because it doesn't do anyone any good if you live in the past. You nor the people around you, it only makes others suffer. So she breathed her last, she died. Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. And over her tomb, Jacob set up a pillar to this day that marks that place, and he moved on again. Now, the irony being in one of the other passages, I think it's chapter 48, it it's, doesn't sound near that nice. I mean, I've got to kind of just uh, read this because it was, maybe need a little humor here, but uh, like we don't have enough. 
in chapter 48, he talks about it, and it's when, I don't know if you know the story, but Joseph ends up being sold like a slave, and he ends up in Egypt and everything that way, and his dad thinks he's lost him, and he comes to find him and, or find out that he's still alive and he can't believe it. And so this is kind of a part of that and when he's getting ready, you know. But in Genesis 48, 5, it says, Now then, your two sons born to you in, in Egypt before I came to you here will be reckoned as mine. So Jacob says, they're my grandsons, but because, Joseph, I thought I'd lost you. I'm so thrilled to know you, but I'm going to give your sons, your two sons are going to be included in the inheritance with my boys, and uh, just as Reuben and Simeon are mine. Any children born to you after them will be yours in the territory they inherit. They will be reckoned under the names of their brothers. As I was returning from Padan, to my sorrow, Rachel died in the land of Canaan while we're still on the way, a little distance from Ephrath, so I buried her there beside the road. I just thought that was a little bit funny, you know, I just buried her there beside the road, you know, but... Back then, they didn't have funerals. They didn't go through the whole thing. It was like it's a very practical thing. This happened, and, you know, wherever you were, unless there was a place that wasn't too far away, you buried them there. Now, back to this then. So when Israel moved on, it in no way indicated in any regard that he didn't still love Rachel. It in no way is a affront to her or a sarcastic look at her oh well, no big deal. It was a huge deal. Got a little baby boy to raise without his mama. What are you going to do? He did the best he could, and he moved on. And as death comes about in our lives, it's one thing to be ready for your own, but I don't know how we ever prepare for everybody else's beyond just walking with God and knowing that like what Job was able to say after losing 10 of his children, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. What's the rest of it? Blessed be the name of the Lord. And so I encourage you tonight, as things continue to unfold in your life, in our lives, in this country, blessed be the name of the Lord. And I promise you, things can get a lot worse in this country, but if we as Christians and believers have that as our mantra and have that as an attitude, I promise you that there will be people that don't know the Lord that will come to know him. But if we react to everything the way the world does, and we're all the time being, oh my, oh my, oh my, then the world won't see that we have anything that they need. But if we have stability in our faith that's in God, no matter whether we can explain it or not, the world will say, I want some of that. And I hope and pray that we're able to give them Jesus when they want it. Let's pray. Father and God, tonight I thank you for our time and study and look and uh, tough issues like dying but god may we not be so afraid of it or the death of others that we forget to live and yet may we know that lord and be like those that your word says we're faithful that we're looking forward to the city whose builder and architect is you god you that this is all just tents here we're all in winnebago's or motorhomes or tents at the best and our bodies even your word continually calls it a tent over and over and over again so god uh, may we remember that but boy, the way we live here is we live with that great anticipation of you've got something solid and secure and sure there. And God, I just thank you for that. But in the meantime, it's not just enduring here. It's living with a purpose, called according to your love and the purpose, Lord, that we could show others how great our God really is. And Lord, tonight I thank you that we can on a whim just go ahead and order pizza. And we can here on the eve of 4th of July, Lord, 230-some years ago when... Um, other men, not, uh, not Lord, a revolution uh, that led to religion, but Lord, a conviction of faith that led to a revolution. As we celebrate, Lord, those men and women and the families that sacrificed so that, Lord, we could uh, feast uh, tonight, we pray. Might we not, Lord, be ignorant of our roots? Might we not be unaware and take our freedom for granted? And Lord, even greater than what we have as a country in our past, so do we have Jesus, you, 2,000 years ago, dying on the cross to sign our declaration of independence from sin. And I pray tonight, God, that um, we wouldn't just have it recorded in your word, that we'd have it in our heart. And we'd show with our soul, maybe we can look back like your scars from the cross, Lord Jesus, but may, may we can look back and see the scars of sin, but may they be old and not fresh. May we have truly overcome. And Lord, in it, might you help us with your power and strength to lead others out of their sin as well. So God, I do pray that you help us. But I thank you for tonight. I thank you that we could meet here and didn't have to 
sneak around guards or anything else can be here with the lights on wide open and jesus that because of you we've got a future that uh, is hard to describe for your word lord that as old as it is still valid man i praise you and for the way that you would love me in spite of me i praise you thank you for your grace and thank you for your grace that would allow me to overcome in the name of jesus i pray amen i know i didn't ask